Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 93. Scott Lasath, the sporting chef, hunt fish cook. Hashtag eat what you kill. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Greg Evers, and I shot the Big Will Buck. And you're about to listen to one of the best outdoor podcasts on the Internet, the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Chris Jacobson field staffer with the hunting grounds. I shot the Viking buck. Our passion is getting youth and new hunters involved in the outdoors and sharing Christ's love through land management. So get ready for another great episode with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Richard Swinford, and I shot the lead sled buck. And you're listening to Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Thanks for joining us again. And uh, somebody else is joining us over there in Ohio, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, Dusty? Man, I tell you, been burned a candle at both ends. But, you know, Jay, that's all right. That's, that's the way dogs got to eat, and we got to be uh, warm this winter. So I've been hauling some firewood. And, how, much, you know, how much firewood are we talking about? Uh, I'm guessing about 15 cords. <laughs> you must be whooped. Yeah, I'm definitely a whoop, but, you know, I, I got some, uh, man, I, I got a package in the mail. Holy smokes, my Culver cameras come in. I'm super excited about that. Oh, those are nice cameras. Oh, yeah, we like Culver cameras. And, uh, you know, not, not just because they sponsor me on Chubby Times Outdoors, but that, the functionality and the quality of pictures that they take. And, you know, I just, I've been very impressed all around with that. So, you know, I got them in the mail and. And it'll be deer hunting season before you know it, as you, as I'm sure you're aware. It's yeah. uh, it's now, it's it's we're in April now, and uh, deer season starts in September, so we're only like six weeks away or six months away. All right, you know, and the morel mushrooms are coming. I just saw it. everything that I get excited about. It's, it's you know, thunder chicken chasing time. It, it's mm-hmm. all coming around, man. It's- yes, you are in the land of big bucks, and you do wait for a big buck. But you you do shoot does for meat. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, never never get above that. You you can't shoot a doe to put in the freezer. There's something wrong. Right. You know, if the area is just loaded full of does, yeah, I I say you need to harvest some of them. Right. A couple of big announcements to make. Yes, we do. Huge. Absolutely. We joined on with the Outdoor Podcast Channel, and it's live now. You can go there and check it out. Outdoorpodcastchannel.com. You can find us on iTunes now. And what the premise of it is, you can go to one channel and get one new outdoor show a day with different perspectives from seven, even eight different outdoor podcasters that live in completely different parts of the country, deal with completely different aspects of hunting, have different hunting philosophies, have different styles of hunting based off of where they live, all on one channel. Isn't that a thing of beauty? Oh, it is a thing of beauty. And I'm honored to be a part of all that. Uh, the Outdoor Podcast Channel dot com. And then you can just type in Outdoor Podcast Channel right there on iTunes. And it's going to be an amazing thing. Seven days a week, new podcast every day. Every day. And you, here's who's on the lineup. You've got us. You've got Up North Journal, Mike Adams and Red. You've got Carrie Z, who is rebranding her or has rebranded her podcast to Hunt fish travel so not only will you get all that stuff that she was doing but now you get to figure out where to hunt where to fish and where to stay if you want to travel to do this stuff you got andy galliano the turkey hunter down in alabama you've got ken blanchard from blanchard outdoors who's been who's known for his black man with a gun podcast now he's turned it over to a brand new podcast called blanchard outdoors 
out of the Maryland area. He's a tremendous podcaster. We've got my good buddies, the Fish Nerds, Dave Kellum and Clave Groves, right here in New Hampshire. So we've actually got two New Hampshire podcasts represented, New Hampshire-based in a sense. Well, you're out of Ohio, but you have three podcasters all on the same channel. Two of them run the Fish Nerds, great fishermen, just they're funny as heck. I love those guys. And Take Aim Outdoors with Brandon Hammonds. We've also got Phil Havens from Bowhunting Freedom has joined on. But the beauty of this whole thing is that we've got other podcasters that we'll be adding. So the content will be more like what you might find at a traditional radio show, but without having to catch the show when it airs. It'll be always downloadable, always on demand, whenever you want it. It's awesome. It is awesome. The second big announcement, Dusty, and this is something we've been doing a little while for the last few shows, is we have created a page that if you like this show, if you're a longtime listener, we would love you to check out our pledge page. It's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. And you can go and support this show because without people like you, it gets it, it makes it very difficult to produce the show and keep it going. Unfortunately, there are some bills we have to pay along the way. And with the help of supporters like you, we get to do this week in, week out, and go find great content like the person we have today. So if you have a moment, if you have a buck, if you'd like to give us a buck per, per episode, that's all great. Don't send it in if you don't have it. Times are tough out there. I don't want that. But if you have an extra dollar, two, 25, 50, if you want a pledge per show, by all means, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Speaking of meat in the freezer, and speaking of the reasons that we can keep doing this, Scott Laysath, the sporting chef, is joining us today, Dusty. Oh, I can't wait to hear all the information that Scott's got about cooking venison and everything else that the chef can cook. I love venison. I love making different dishes with venison. I And you always send me your videos when you decide to throw some down in some lard. Oh, man. It's the best. Get Scott on so we can talk about things like that and corning your venison and uh, venison jerky and how to cook it right. And the he's going to leave us with some great tips. So let's get Scott. Scott Laysath, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, Chef? Good, good to be here. Things are well. Excellent. So you, you're in California, as, as I take it. <laughs> the other California. I always have to make that very clear. I'm in Northern California, um, where we shoot ducks and quail and pheasants and things, not the one you see on TV. So you're in the cool part of California. <laughs> That's the part I think is cool, anyway. You know, I'm about an hour and a half from either Lake Tahoe, Napa Valley. This is a very agricultural rice growing area, and we're in the middle of the Pacific Flyway. So it's uh, there's there's a lot to shoot at and catch here. We've got tons of salmon and steelhead and striper. What we need right now is water. We're in the fourth year of a drought. Oh wow, no kidding. So the Colorado's drying up, but you're not even on that part of town. You're uh, way Sacramento north of River. That. Sacramento okay. River runs through the middle of my of where I live. I live in Folsom, California, and we can, we rely on the Sierra Nevada snowpack, of which right now it is eight percent of normal. Wow. Yeah. Eight percent of normal. Eight percent of normal is a problem. They said if we have a hundred and fifty percent average rainfall from here on out, we might catch up, but that's not likely to happen. And you know, people here are cutting back. We have, you know, we have certain days we can water, and the farmers are taking a beating on their on their water rights. And so, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do to make it rain, but we need it in a big way. Oh, fascinating! You know, we've got a hundred day, hundred plus day duck season. We can shoot. 25 geese a day um we had a late goose season here we we can we can't shoot any more than 10 specks uh 15 snows or 10 canada geese in a day but we can shoot 25 and we're really really long on speckle bellies here right now speckle bellies oh wow interesting yeah that it surprises a lot of people they don't they don't expect that in from california no not at all I've just learned more about the speckle belly. Recently, we had a guest on the show that could do a speckle belly mouth call with just his mouth. He was <laughs> a fascinating individual. So, yeah, I don't, 
I don't I don't know how you could pull that off, but I do know that of the geese, it's my definite preferred goose to eat. Oh, interesting. I want to get into that in a second. Now, Scott, you're a chef, uh, first and foremost. You're known for being a chef. You know, my background was being in the restaurant business for many, many years, and you know, I didn't really become a chef until people started calling me chef. But didn't didn't go to culinary attitude to hold you for ransom on a Friday night and say, hey, either you give me more money or I'm leaving. You want to be able to say, have a nice time. Um, I'll send you your check. Right. Right. So, I, you know, I started, somebody noticed what it is I did. And I would do noon news segments on the game, the things that we would do at the restaurant. And, and, and somebody from HGTV contacted me and I did Three years on both sides of the camera on a show on HGTV, we would do 65 shows in six weeks. Wow. So three, <laughs> Holy three, sh- it was crazy. Yeah. Three complete shows a day. Uh, Paul, um, Homegrown Cooking with Paul James was the name of the show. And Paul James also had gardening by the yard for a number of years. So um, I had a catering company. We did banquets for for a, like 40 different chapters of sporting groups, Ducks Unlimited, California Waterfowl every year for hundreds of large guys who eat lots of food. And um, I've always hunted and fished and I've been on Sportsman Channel since they started 11 plus years ago. And again, as I mentioned, not a career path I could have planned. Here I am. Just just kind of fell in your lap. and Pretty much. I mean, it's a lot of hard work, but it and it has its ups and downs, but, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm unemployable. So, um, I kind of have to do something like this. <laughs> gotcha. That's, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a good pass. So what's your favorite kind of game to eat? Uh, you know, I'm partial to elk caribou, but you know, because I cook so much of everything, I can get tired of anything. I mean, if, if I'm spending five days cooking elk for a particular event or something, I don't want to see elk for another week or two, at least. Mm. Um, I, I just got done doing some consumer shows in Southern California where I was, it was all fish. So every day I've got these giant tuna, yellowtail, grouper, um, just beautiful fish. And I really don't need to see any fish for a little while. So, so it comes and goes. Um, there's not a whole lot that I don't like, but my moods kind of change on what the favorite dish is. I could see that. I mean, my, my mood changes throughout the year, like this time of year, well, more or less in March and, and early April, I want like fried fish for some reason. I don't know why, but right. uh, I don't want that in late April or May. Just well, you know, it's, it's, as the weather warms up, it's, it's, you know, you, you kind of get away from the comfort foods, the, the chowders and the saucier type of foods. And, you know, it's kind of having some fried fish out on the back patio is kind of what I start thinking about now. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, I, was I know this is, I love cooking shows in general. My wife is a chef by trade. So she, uh-huh. you know, we, food is a major component of our household, whether she's doing the cooking or, or I'm doing the cooking. We have some of the finest food around and we, sure. we don't even go out to eat much because we always feel like we can do it better. And it, it's, it's frustrating, but it's still good in a lot of ways. You know, and I'm kind of the same way. I'm people will say, "Man, we don't want it. We we would be embarrassed to have you over for dinner." And you know the deal. I go, you, you know what? As long as you're cooking, a burger sounds great. Right. Um, what kind of kills me is some of the higher end places that you're thinking we just spent one hundred and fifty dollars for three or four people and or two people. And really, if we had just taken that money and brought it home. We could have come up with a really good dinner ourselves. Oh yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can shop better. You can find the, the better ingredients in a lot of ways. Right, yeah. better bottle of wine. Better bottle you know. of wine for a lot less yeah. money. Yes, sure. absolutely. I got to say, I do enjoy just going to somebody else's house, though, and, and and if especially if they are into cooking somewhat and learning how what they're going to prepare or how they did it, or you know, I'm, I'm more than happy just to eat a basic bur- basic burger at somebody else's house but I'm not so into a basic burger at some restaurant. Yeah, me too. Same deal. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. Um, you know, throw some, you know, especially when you do the game thing or the fish thing and everybody just kind of brings their favorite fish and game and it's not always something wrapped in bacon. To me, that's kind of fun. It is cool. 
Uh, D- Dusty, you have some favorites that uh, you've shared with me over the past. What, what do you think about when you think about food at home? You know, it's uh, one of the things where the, the seasons kind of change the tone on what my taste buds like. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of similarities to, bo- to both of you, and uh, we try to mix it up. Now you, you're uh, you have a lot of venison. I, you always, anytime you cook venison, Dusty, Dusty will send me a picture of it. <laughs> Said, ha ha! Look what I'm cooking because he knows sure. I'm out typically. So, right. Dusty, how much venison do you have left in your freezer right now? Oh man, I, I without looking, I'm, I'm guessing. Five packs of grindings, uh, maybe two packs of, uh, I'm going to say backstrap, and m- maybe one fish. I always hide a fish in there, so it's like a, a summer surprise to find the, the package of that fish in the freezer. It's like, oh, man, I almost forgot all about this. Gotcha. So this is one of the things I clutch back to. Late summer, uh, when falls is getting close, it just kicks off the, the hunting season. Gotcha. Well, I think fresh food is the best. I mean, fresh venison fresh uh fish all, all that is fine but at some point you have to store it uh, scott sure. do you store stuff at your house i do um i'm a big vacuum pack food saver guy um it makes a big difference food saver claims that you know your fish is good for two years i'm still eating my fish within three months yeah um and i'm like you i i would much much rather eat it fresh than frozen but you can if you want to eat venison in july you're going to have to freeze it um and i freeze it in large chunks like if, if i've got deer for instance um if i have a venison roast um i will normally just take those whole muscles out um and freeze them in chunks rather than cut them into steaks one of the things that i find i i haven't been able to quite figure it out yet is when you take your meat to a processor and they'll take those back straps and they cut them into chunks and then butterfly them. Mm. Why? I'm ready. I'm ready for the answer. If somebody can give me a good answer why I shouldn't leave my loin in, say, 10 to 12 inch strips as opposed to butterflied medallions, I'm ready. I'm I'm ready for the answer. Right. I don't, yeah. you, I don't have an answer. I'd but say you know what? I'm, go ahead. No, I'm going to say that they do it to dry out your meat. Well, why would they want to do that? I, I don't get I, What do you mean, to dry out the medallions? Uh, I'm being smart rear here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought maybe it was an aging thing. But you know what, Dusty, you know what I'm talking about. You take it to a processor, yeah, and they it's and sickening. It's, why? It's and I'll ask, sickening. Uh-uh. I'll ask the processors, and they'll say, well, it's, it's what the customer wants. That's not what I want. <laughs> right. I'm with you. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you got to... Uh, let me get into something here that I'm going to cover this just real quick. You know, they're sure. taking it to a processor, uh, maybe because they don't know what they're doing. Not saying everybody. Right. Or, you know, but they they ask the processor, do you want them cut, cut butterfly or whole, you know? Uh, a lot of people say just cut them, butterfly them, and, and we'll store them that way. Not knowing. You know, maybe we can educate them. You leave your tenderloins long, thick, holds moisture, and freezes better, stores longer. Right. A little educational there. Yeah. Well, and I think people get entirely too much of their deer ground, in my opinion, because um, they've maybe had a tough hindquarter steak or two, or somebody hasn't removed all the silver skin, hasn't hasn't properly handled that that uh, that hindquarter. I'll take even an old older animal hindquarter and just trim around, get rid of anything that's not muscle, um, cut it into one inch two inch steaks and i'll use a a tenderizer like a jacquard have you seen those j-a-c-c-a-r-d it's a spring-loaded thing and actually i found somebody just sent me what i think might be a better mousetrap and it's called a victor um victor tenderizer of some sort victor meat tenderizer um and what it has is these steel blades that cut through the connective tissue of it but it doesn't turn it into cube steak, doesn't change the composition of it at all. You put a little olive oil, maybe some red wine, garlic, fresh herbs on there, and just let it sit there for a couple hours. And I often serve people backstrap or serve people hindquarter that they say, oh, wow, this backstrap's really good. And it's not, instead of having it all ground into burger. Interesting. Very interesting. Scott, tell us about the sporting shift. How, how did you come up with that? Well, um, the, the current form of the sporting chef show on sportsman channel started uh january last year okay 
Um, I had a sporting chef show many years ago that transitioned into another show called Hunt, Fish, Cook that ran for years on Sportsman Channel. Um, I get tired of watching myself on TV, maybe. <laughs> um, there's a whole lot of people with different opinions, different styles of cooking. Um, I think attention spans are getting infinitely shorter, not longer. True. I agree. And so, I mean, I might have eight different people on a Sporting Chef show in one show. Um, I'm kind of the thread throughout the show, and we're kind of tossing back and forth to all these different people. And we've got some names people will recognize, like a, a Fred and Michelle Eichler who cook on the show, and Jana Waller and other Sportsman Channel hosts. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, some people, there's a, a redneck named Buddy Topher who... <laughs> When I had the Dead Meat Show is another show I have on Sportsman Channel where we do python, iguana, nutria, armadillo things nobody wants to eat. And uh, as a matter of fact, that he sent me a note when I had the Dead Meat Show, and he said, um, "We want you to come to Texas because we've got all sorts of stuff nobody wants to eat." Hmm. So I just spent a week or so in Mexico with him in February. He looks like a Texas redneck, white-haired version of a Duck Dynasty character. His, you're not quite sure what you've seen after a minute or a minute and a half of Buddy, but it's different. And then we've got Hank Shaw, who is yep. a James Beard Award winner, lives probably 10 minutes from my house. He's a good friend. Uh, David Draper from Field and Stream and uh, Cook with Cabela's. We got a whole bunch of people on there. So if you don't like what you're looking at, just wait about a minute and a half and you're probably going to see somebody else you like. Oh, wow. How, how fast does it roll like that? Is it just uh... Uh, a long segment is three minutes. Um, we've got a lot of one, one and a half, two minute segments. We shoot 26 new shows a year when we're running all 52 weeks. And um, so it's uh, Camp Chef is our title sponsor. And if it wasn't for Camp Chef, we wouldn't we wouldn't have a show. I've been a Camp Chef fan for 20 some odd years. Um, and I give them a hard time because I tell them it took them took me 17 years before I could get them as a sponsor on the show. Um, <laughs> they underwrote my first cookbook 20 something years ago. And, I, and that was and that was about the extent of it. But um, it, we produce it very simply. A lot. It's a collaborative effort, which I really, really like. Lots of different styles of cooking. You know, what I do is not for everyone, but there's somebody on there that's going to appeal to someone. I, I like what you're saying. Um, I have. I'm a fan of Camp Chef as well. Uh huh. And I I recently bought a Camp Chef smoker. Way to go! Did yeah. Did you get the 18, the 24, or the smoke or the uh, pellet smoker? I got the the. Big gas powered one. Uh huh. Yeah, right. I think that's the 24. The 24 inch smoke ball. I did an entire Christmas dinner in because my oven went out the night before. Yes. Yeah. Here's why I got the Camp Chef. And I did a lot of research online. I watched videos. I looked at other brands. I went down to local sporting goods, looked at their stuff. And I came back to Camp Chef um, ultimately because I liked the size of it. They had the best videos that, that yep. I could find. Um, I like the idea of propane, and I was kind of tossing it up between a, a traditional smoker, uh, an electric smoker, a pellet smoker, and the gas. The reason I wanted the gas because I didn't want to have to plug into an electric outlet. Somehow that's wrong to me. I didn't really, I don't like the <laughs> idea of having to rely on electricity. I also didn't want to be, I didn't want all the ex the the work that I think goes into the old school traditional smoker. I I, I wanted something that was a little more efficient. And I wanted to be able to take my smoker around fairly easily by loading it in the back of my pickup truck. And if I wanted to go out on the ice and do some ice fishing and smoke something for the day, I could do that. Yep. And that whole package seemed to be just right. And the reason I actually wanted it in the first place is because on Thanksgiving Day of this year, or this last Thanksgiving, we had a major snowstorm. And it shut down power across the entire state for about seven days mm -hmm. and I still had to cook dinner and I was not going to lose because we were out of electricity going back to sure. the, I don't want to plug it in anything. So we, we, my wife and I, my wife being the chef, we started spatchcocking turkeys and uh -huh. fit, fit it all onto my gas grill and threw some, uh, some wood chips on it. And it, I swear to God, it was the best 
Thanksgiving meal we have ever had. I've, I've put, I can put six 15 pound turkeys, um, end of the, the 24 inch camp chef deal. And, and I've had most smokers, people send me smokers, right? You know, cause it's kind of what I do. So, um, the electronics on most of them at some point are going to go south on you. The heating elements are going to go south on you. Um, and the fact, like you said, that you, that you need power to make it happen. Um, the simplicity of just a propane unit that, and you can actually get it up to 400 and something degrees. I mean, I've done roasted vegetables. Like I said, I did an entire Christmas dinner in mine and you can't do that in most of them. Um, and I have pear trees in my backyard, so I just cut up chunks of pear wood, throw a couple of chunks in there. You don't need to get any special chips or anything else. And once it's seasoned, if you're not a big fan of a lot of smoke, uh, just throw whatever you want in there, and you're going to get a mild smoke flavor on there, and you don't need to put any wood chips or anything else at all in there. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. That's a, that's a very good tip on smokers. And the, the way the smoker thing worked out is that I, I didn't want, I managed to get everything uh, stacked up in my grill and smoked and cooked off. And it was, it was delicious, but it was snug. It was real snug. So I wanted something bigger and I always wanted to get my own barbecue. And I said, well, this is the opportunity to do that. I will never be able to cook, not cook Thanksgiving dinner comfortably uh, ever again. (laughs) That's basically what it came down to. But since then, we've done smoked salmon, uh, sure. done ribs. I have just been knocking or just rocking it with all kinds of venison jerky. Mm-hmm. And I just, for me, everything should have, anything savory should have a hint of smoke in it somehow. I'm with you. And, and what I wouldn't, I tend to let mine go a little too long because I use it a lot. And I know when it starts dripping black stuff onto my food. It's time to clean it, but I never really, I never trust a clean smoker. Um, but once you get them blacked and seasoned, I'm telling you, it just doesn't require a whole lot. There's not much to it. That's interesting. I, yeah. One of the things, and you might have run across this, is one of the the arguments against propane was the Mercaptan doing a a layer of sulfur or something of that nature on the meat itself. Any truth to that? You've, have you heard uh, of Yeah, you know, I don't. I, not to me. I um, and I'm not nearly as afraid of my food as as a lot of people are. Um, I, you know, I, I, that hasn't bothered me. I've taken a glance at the information, and I'm not. I, I'm not. I don't know. I, there's other things I worry about. That's not one of them. Yeah, I, I being a an old scientist from way back too, I've I kind of figured out that this is not. This might be a purist thing. Like if you want to go real wood, real smoker, that's a purist thing. You may want to not do have that as an element. But in right. reality, you probably couldn't do a taste test against another piece of food and, and be able to tell the difference when it was no. all said and done. No, and I took chemistry for about three minutes at the University of Arizona. So um, <laughs> I went and took home gardening after that, I think. I have a liberal arts degree. We really have. What did that require? <laughs> that's awesome. So Hunt Fish Cook was one of the original adventures way back. Yep, that was, uh, and that was as recent as 2013. Uh, and the, Donnie McElvoy did the front half of the show. He did the hunting and fishing, and I did the cooking. Um, and that we shot most of it around Huntsville, Alabama. So a lot of people think I live in Alabama, but we just produced the show there. Mm-hmm. Um, I travel a bunch, and I had met them while I was out that way doing something for someone else and they had a show and i started a show and we said you know why don't we just combine them uh join forces join sponsors kind of mix it up and and again it was always i was always trying to do things that kind of keep people interested um and something that would interest me uh even on the show that i have now we still have people like melissa bachman doing shooting tips and um we we have just enough kills and fish jumping out of the water to keep people along with us during the, during the ride that may not be into cooking quite so much. Um, but not enough to distract from those who are watching the show for cooking. Gotcha. I'm glad to hear that you've done some stuff with Jana Waller. She's a friend of ours from the show. She was on episode 56 of our podcast here a long time ago. Um, but we've become pretty good friends over just, you know, communication by phone and and different, just talking about the business of hunting basically. Right. 
and right. it's, it's, she's been a great asset. So I'm glad you got to work with her. And Hank Shaw seems like a fascinating guy too. Yeah, Hank's, you know, Hank's history, Hank was a political writer for many, many years. Hmm. And so that's kind of, that was, that was his job for a long time for, he was in Richmond, Virginia and Stockton, California. And, you know, uh, political writers, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, they're kind of like outdoor writers in a lot of respect. And then a lot of newspapers did away with their outdoor sections and that kind of thing. And so um, Hank got kind of a late start on the hunting part, but he's always been a fishing guy. And, you know, Hank is the, is the guy that I refer people to who are more on the foodie side and want to get a little bit more in depth and, and maybe a few more obscure ingredients. I am, you know, my style has always been fewer ingredients, uh, a little more. I like to simplify it because I really want people to make their fish and game taste better. And then if they're, if they get to that point, because so many times I have people say, man, I love to shoot ducks but I hate to eat them. So I'll say, who says Let's that try. by the way? <laughs> oh, I hear it so many times. I, cause I do a lot of shows, a lot of hunting and fishing shows um, around the country. And I have people coming up and say, you know, it just tastes like liver and you know, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of liver. So if duck tasted like liver, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a big fan. I'm the cooking editor for ducks unlimited magazine too. So right. ducks and geese are a big deal for me. Um, you know, you say, Saltwater brine. Keep it, keep it simple. Draw the blood out. Give it a little more, you know, mild, mild it out a little bit rather than trying to cover up the flavor. Don't overcook it. And and they'll say, hey, or try a bite of this. And they'll say, man, what did you do? <laughs> I said, I did a lot less than what you did. It was actually simpler. So, you know, I want people to kind of start with me. And if they want to take it to the next step, give Hank a call and, um, and he has, and his, 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 his recipes are a lot more involved than mine. Um, I'm, I just want people to use it. I think duck, I mean, I love liver to begin mm -hmm. with, right? but I, I love duck too. I don't think they taste at all alike, but duck. No, but you, but you've heard it described as tasting livery and, yeah. and gamey a lot, right? Yeah, I have heard that, but I, I never understood it. And because <laughs> my palate doesn't detect that, I think but I think duck is some of the finest meat on the planet. Hands well, I yeah, I obviously think so too. Yeah, so it's amazing. Well, this kind of brings up a, another topic, and of course, this is the deer hunting podcast. So, I want to talk some more venison with you, Scott, if that's cool. Sure. And one of the things I wanted, if you could, and, and I've heard about this whole process, but I've never done it, and I think there are a lot of people that might try it, especially this time of year. Can you walk us through how to corn venison? I'm sure it's just like corning meat, but how, what's the process to corn venison so that you can use it like a corned beef type recipe is, or hash? And it is identical in taste to corned beef. It's it's ridiculous. I use the exact same corning process that I use for venison. I use it for snow geese, um, big Canada goose breasts, um, and, and, I'll say, and I'll say, here, try this, or I'll make some you know, corn venison hash and, and you really can't tell the difference. And in the process, I don't have it in front of me because I'm afraid if I do that, I'm going to lose you on the computer ex as far as exact quantities, mm. but it's basically it's salt, sugar, and sodium nitrite. Okay. Uh, pink salt, Morton's, if you get Morton's tender quick, yep. um, that works. I'm not going to tell you the exact quantities because you can go online and Google it. And it's all the, it's all going to be really really close. The process um, of corning is you're basically pickling meat. Um, there's no corn involved. Uh, for people that don't know this, the corning comes from the salt that it was packed in before was were were large grains of salt that were called corns. So they would say we were corning the meat. Mm, um, okay. No corn, just and sodium nitrite scares people, and it's a but it shouldn't. Um, it's basically a preservative. Um, and it's going to, it kills the bacteria, um, and it's used as, as to preserve it, and it's used to give it that red color. So when you, if you take an average, let's say, if you take a three or four pound of venison hindquarter roast, yes, and, and you put it into this brine solution that has the water salt, uh, sugar, sodium nitrite, um, and it's going to take at least a week in that brine in order for it to penetrate all the way through. 
And the way you tell that it's penetrated all the way through is you basically, you can either cut it in half or do whatever, and you look inside, and if it's not red all the way through, it hasn't brined long enough. Um, okay. It won't it won't taste any different, but you don't really want to eat gray-ish corned food, right? Right, no. It's the, it's the eye appeal. So that's where the sodium nitrite comes in. So you let it soak for a week or so until it's reddish all the way through. You throw it into a pot of boiling water with pickling spices and garlic and whatever else you want to put in there, just like you would a corned beef brisket. Um, and it will eventually get very tender. It will start to break apart. And it will taste exactly exactly like corned beef. It's uh, uncanny. And it, so it sounds like you can do it with different types of meats and end up with the same product eventually. Pretty darn close. And you can add different flavors to it, too. You don't have to – I mean, you can add, uh, you know, like I said, fresh garlic, rosemary. You could add some heat to it. You can kind of play around with it. One of my favorite things to do with any of it is to make um, like a corn venison hash and break a couple of – over easy eggs right on top of that and serve it to people and they just go nuts. Oh, <laughs> that sounds so good right now. Oh yeah. Oh wow. So sounds delicious. Yeah. Doesn't it? Oh uh -huh. man. Uh -huh. So or slice it right. Or you slice it with some rye bread and a uh, Swiss cheese and make a Reuben, Reuben type of deal with some of that Reuben dressing on there too. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you can't tell for people that say, I don't like venison. Give them one of those sandwiches and tell them to shut up. It tastes just like corned beef. Right. Throw it on a little panini back. press and you're you're styling. Yep. I'll be back in a minute. I gotta go to the refrigerator, guys. You guys, <laughs> do, I'm done. <laughs> Dusty needs a snack. Something, dang. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's cool. I mean, I always wanted to know about corn venison. Now, one of the things that w we've started to experiment at um, in my house is actually instead of doing the traditional boiled corned beef, we started roasting a little bit. Do you have any recommendations sure. on that? You know, it's it's the process is the same, but when I'm roasting it, you kind of it, it's going to need some moisture to break that down. Um, so I don't know when you're roasting it, are you adding anything to it? Is there so you're not braising it, you're actually roasting it. So it's open and it's dry and yeah, it's open and it's dry. Although uh, I'm I'm a little bit fond of wrapping it because it reminds me of what you do after you smoke uh, a brisket, for example. Uh, right. Then you wrap it so it tenderizes it. Yeah, that's when the magic happens, um, at least for those of us who don't have 18 hours to cook a brisket, is when you wrap it and and it just starts to get nice and tender. And, and you know, I've never known exactly on the judging of the bridge of the briskets. I know they're looking for certain things. I just want it to taste good. Um, but I and I, you know, I, I haven't done much roasting with something like a brisket because it normally to me. It does need a little moist heat at some point in it. I mean, you could—I'm sure you could roast it, get it to 175, 180, and then wrap it, and right. that's where it'll—it'll it'll start to steam. Um, and I, I would I would imagine it would do the same thing. Yeah, I think what I did the last time is I ended up uh, we—I think I boiled it a little bit just to get some of the salts off, and then wrapped it, and and then at the end I opened it up uh, huh. when it, and just to kind of crystallize whatever I had on the top. Sure. And it worked out pretty good. I have some other things I'm going to experiment with just to get a little more of the saltiness out of it because it was a little, right. little too much, which I think boiling helps with. Um, but it, it was still delicious no matter how you chalk it up. And the hash would have been tremendous the next day uh, if there was and any you know, left. And you could always cut down on the salt. I mean, maybe your cure just had a little bit too much salt in it. I know you need salt in there, obviously, but maybe cut back on the salt and see if that'll if it'll still cure okay not Maybe not be quite as salty. Okay. Definitely we'll try that next time. It's it's always a test. You know, you tweak it, you tweak it, you tweak it. Sure. Kind of thing. Yep. Lots of fun. All right. One of the next things I want to talk about, and this is like a classic conversation, it's cliche. It's about gaminess in venison. Mm -hmm. I had uh, some of uh, my good friend Lane Benoit, a famous deer hunter out of Vermont, passed away just recently. And he... His last buck that he shot was a buck out of Wisconsin. The meat, and I got, I got to have a sample of that. I had dinner with his cameraman um, after he passed, and that meat tasted different to me than any venison I would have had in New Hampshire. Right. And this is what I'm wondering about. Was it the way it was prepared? Was it the way it was 
um, treated after the harvest, or is it just simply a diet thing of what the deer are eating? They're eating more on corn, or how much does the diet weigh in here? What do I have to look at when we talk about gaminess? What makes game gamey? So was it was it different good or different bad from Wisconsin? It wasn't. I didn't. Most, or just different. Just different. Like it was less. Uh, uh, I want to say tangy. I would say there's right. like a little tang to venison. A lot of times it tasted almost like beef, as opposed to any of the what I would say most people identify as even a hint of gaminess. Where you can say if you're understand what it is, you can say this is venison. This is beef. It tasted more like beef than venison. Well, my guess is it probably wasn't, you know, it's obviously diet makes a big difference. Age makes a difference. Sex makes a difference. Um, To me, nothing tastes better than a young doe, personal preference. Um, But I've also had large male animals that tasted great. I've had large male animals. I've had same sex, same age uh, deer shot out of relatively the same area at the same time, and one tasted different than the other. Wow. Um, it's not a feedlot, so it's not the controlled environment that we get. I mean, you can go to the grocery store and get a steak and go, that was a good, that was a good ribeye, and go back the next week and go, ah, you True. know, and that's, and that's under completely controlled conditions, Most, very, right. I mean, comparatively speaking. That's a good, um, that's a good point. So, it's always been my experience that, you know, like like the cliche goes, that you are what you eat. And um, if that's the case, bacon should taste bad, right? <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> but bacon tastes pretty darn good, and we know that pigs aren't all that discriminating. Right. Um, corn seems to make a big difference to me. Uh, you know, corn compared to some of the other things, the other browse that depending on – I don't know what your deer are eating where you are, but um, the, I'm uh, guessing it's – during the during the winter, uh, uh-huh. they're eating acorns, or in the fall right. they're eating a lot of acorns. Um, still grazing on some grass, but then they get in the hemlocks, and you can if you shoot a deer, or you, even if you pick up a roadkill, for example, which I'm a big fan of, uh, right. they they smell like hemlock. <laughs> so obviously that's going to affect the finished product. Um, but all is not lost. You just have to treat it differently. When I when somebody wherever I am gives me a hunk of meat. Um, First thing I do is I'll cut a little piece off, put a little salt and pepper on it, throw it in a hot skillet, cook it rare to medium rare, and go. How does this behave? Um, so if it's if it's tough and chewy, I'm going to need to tenderize it. Now you know it's there's not a whole lot of fat in a in a deer anyway. You know it's like three grams of fat and three and a half ounces. So ten times leaner than beef, it's not going to be very forgiving. So um, if it's tough. You got a choice of either you can stew it, cook it slowly, low temp until it breaks apart. You know, that's why that's why we have crock pots. And that's why, unfortunately, people use them a little too often mm. because they're very forgiving. You can cook anything long enough in liquid and it, it will eventually fall off the bone and take, taste just like cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> but you can also slice it across the grain very thin, very thinly and do a stir fry with it and get and, and the results are great with that, too. Um, if it's off tasting and okay, do you know Benny spies? Who's got gun it with Benny spies on sportsman channel? Yeah. Um, I did a deal with him in Virginia last September. He said, man, I shot this moose and it's awful tasting. I don't know what it is. I can't eat it. I'm uh, the dogs don't want it. He said, I don't know what to do with it. I said, send me some moose. So we actually did it on the sporting chef show. He sent me the moose and it was packaged. He sent me loins that were packaged just like I don't like them. Where they're all sliced up, uh, butterfly packed into a into a deal, and then butcher paper wrapped. Uh, the silver skin was still on there. There was still some gristle and fat on there. And I threw the the uh, loin pieces on a grill, started tasting it. The meat was absolutely fine. As soon as I got to the outside, to the silver skin, to the to the funky stuff on the outside that should have been trimmed from the beginning, that was rank. So, of course, when you grind all that in, your ground is going to be bad. Um, and there's not a whole lot you can do with it then except perhaps feed it to the dog. Um, right. So so really, that's so that's the way too long answer to what do you do with gamey? You never know. Um, you if you if you're in the south, you don't drive around with it in the back of your truck all day and show people your deer. That's right. 
we all know. We hear it all the time. You get it clean. You get it. You field dress it. You pack it with ice. You keep it as cool as you can, and you get it to the processor or to your cold storage area as fast as you can. Um, you know, I like to hang it. I like, depending on the on the age of the animal, I like to hang it for a week or so. Um, I think the dry aging. There's a buddy of mine, John McGannon, who has a company, Wild Eats. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows more about dry aging than John McGannon. Um, even if, if you have deer roasts that are in your freezer now that are not tender, take them out of the freezer, put them on a rack in your refrigerator with a pan underneath and let it sit there for five or six days. Don't cover it. I want it to air dry. I, I want to try and get rid of some of that capillary blood that's in there and get it nice and tender. Even if it's been frozen, it hasn't been aged already. It'll make a gigantic difference on the te- on the tenderness of that of that roast that you have. Um, so it's not too late to dry age, even if you've been, if it's been processed and frozen. Um, don't overcook it. You know, you can you you get gaminess. People try and cook gamey flavors out of meat, out of venison, and what they do is make it more gamey by cooking it too long. I'll say, how do you how do you order your steaks when you go to a restaurant? And they'll say, well, I'm I'm, I'm medium. And I'll say, describe the color of medium. And they'll say, well, it's just still has a little pink. I'm going, you know, you're kind of getting into the medium well range. Right. And my venison and and people listening are going to some will blanch at this, but my venison is still a little purple in the center when it's done. Oh, wow. It, it ain't pink. And so let it sit for a few minutes. I don't bring my better cuts. I don't bring them past 130 degree internal temperature. Um you will just if you're used to tough, dry, chewy meat, uh, this this may just change your mind. Take a venison steak, cut it in half, cook half of it medium rare, half of it medium well. One's gamier than the other, I promise. Gotcha. Dust, do you want to weigh in on that? Having uh, venison from Ohio versus other states you've had from? Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent on the diet. Uh, you know what what the deer consumes is is what the the deer is going to taste like. You know if you got a deer that's uh, grain fed eating on clover, hay, grass, you know, it, it's no different on the beef. But, you know, then, then Scott brought up a great point by you are what you eat. You know, you, deer are grazers. When they see something that's edible, they're going to eat it if they're hungry. You know, there's no really set pattern on what they consume. Now, you get into a, a pre-rut where the deer is actually trying to consume a lot of nutrition and getting ready for his uh for the rut to kick in, the deer naturally is going to taste better because he, he's been stuffing his belly with corn, soybean hulls, soybeans if they're still standing here in Ohio. Now where you're at, Jay, you know, you get into the hemlocks and you get into the acorns. And to me, that, that there is a, like a, almost like a dry food. And it, they, they eat a little grass out where you're at, Jay. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, we don't have fields like you guys do or anything, but where they can find fields, they'll they'll get into them, eat at night. Um, and oftentimes when you harvest a deer, especially early season, their their stomachs will be filled with grass. Right, you know, and, and grass, is a, grass is a good tenderizer. It, it, the molecules in grass absolutely will. Well, if you eat a grass-fed beef versus a grain-fed, there's a huge difference in tenderization and, you know, but they're, they're, they're probably more likely to eat the acorns where you're at and kind of grazing the grass to maybe cap off their stomach, uh, you know, through, through the night. But around here, a lot of corn fed. I mean, it, it's like eating a beef here in Ohio. It really is tender. Uh, you know, you, you get into a, 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 some of the areas down south that are, are more woodsy and, and less uh, crop fields. They, they have a little more gamier taste to me, what people call a gamey taste. I don't know really if there is an actual... Uh, taste that's gamey, but it's a different flavor meat. Does that, does that sound right, Scott? Oh, absolutely. And and, and I, I would hope that people will stop using gamey to describe something that tastes off or tastes bad. Right. Um, uh, but that's that's kind of what the word implies to everybody else is that it's it's gamey. Yeah. Just, yeah. Gamey is a oh. bad word to me. Like, that's the way my socks smell. <laughs> gamey should not describe meat. No, <laughs> Is that the no, smell no. I smelled at the hotel, Jay? Absolutely. Gamey <laughs> socks. And just, just because it, it happens to have a little bit different tinge to it or because, you know, just because they've been feeding on, on acorns instead of corn, you know, all is not lost. It's just it's going to have a different flavor. 
Um, it may not be as tender as, as and as fatty. So maybe you just have to treat it a little different. You know, put a little marinade on it, add a little fat to it, um, have a use a good quality olive oil and some garlic and some fresh herbs and maybe a little wine or a little balsamic vinegar and let it sit in there for a while so it will absorb some of that marinade. Um, don't overcook it. And, you know, you can you can make them taste very similar. They're not going to taste the same, but all is not lost just because you happen to get a, de- a lean deer in rut or a deer that's been eating hemlock. You just have to kind of treat it a little different. It just might take a little bit more work. Absolutely. I agree to that 100%. You know, and I'm going to throw one other thing in there. You know, when you, when you harvest a, a, a deer, take time to investigate after you've got all the internals out, the organs and everything. Take time to investigate your venison right there. The the story begins right there. How how am I going to cook this is a lot of times based off what I find in the stomach sack. Sure. You know, if I if I cut a stomach sack open and it's full of acorns, some uh, tree bark where they've been nipping on some trees, you know, not much grass, and, and in your case, Jay, you see some hemlock in there, that's going to tell you a story about how that meat's going to taste from the start. You know, it, it all starts right there. You see what the deer has been, uh, what he's been dieting on, what his nutritional value is in his stomach. And from that point on, you can take that deer home and say, I know this deer has been eating hemlocks, acorns, not much grass. I didn't find much grass in the stomach sack. And, and, and you go from that. You do the proper removal of the deer. You, you try to get the deer cooled off, get the meat, start to, the cool down process at, at early there. As soon as you get done, uh, get it in the truck, get some ice on it. You know, if you show a couple of buddies on the way, great, but don't. Spend all day with that deer in the back of your truck. Get it to the processor or your your cool storage, wherever you're taking the deer to have it cut up. And if you can leave it hang, let it hang. If the if the temperatures are right, you know I, I I don't want a deer to freeze, but yet I want it to to cool down somewhere in the 35 degree to 38 degree range. You know I'm I'm pretty comfortable letting the deer there. That, that's that's typical refrigerator temperatures. So let that deer age a little bit. Let the tenderization process and all the 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 meat start to break down before you put a knife to it give it a chance to to do its natural thing that meat does you know get the hide off let that deer start to to tenderize itself i I, i'm along with scott on the seven day window you can let that deer hang seven days and get conditions are right you don't want to leave a deer hang if you know it's going to get in 40 50 degree temperatures that's not what we're saying but if temperatures are right it may get down to 32 at night getting up to 35 38 range during the day that's comfortable hanging temperatures for a deer. Absolutely going to be the best thing for that meat to let it, let it hang, tenderize itself, then cut it up, properly store it, and, and know the story from that deer, and get into some chef preparations that Scott's offering. You know, he just told us how to marinate your meat so that you pull some of that that different taste that from from a different deer in a different area. All deer are different; they, none of them are the same. Good point. Very good point. Scott, let's uh, move on to something else that's a, a big I'm a big fan of. What's your best jerky recipe? Do you make a lot of jerky, or is it something that's a chef doesn't even pay attention? To? Uh, you know, I make a lot of jerky. I use, uh, believe it or not, I use high mountain jerky kits that anybody can use. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, and and I do. I use their jerky kits. I use their summer sausage. Now, full disclosure. They are a sponsor of the Sporting Chef Show, so I'm long on High Mountain product. Okay. So they make it really simple. Um, it, you know, since we don't, re- you know, again, we've got, we're going to involve some cure and we're going to involve some sodium nitrite. If you just take your your venison, even it, depending on how you like, you know, some people like it really, really tender. In which case, get the ground, get the little cock gun extruder, and do the soft extruded. Tender, uh, that very tender jerky. I like mine a little on the chewier side. Me um, too. Me too. I, I prefer to chew on it for a while. I do too. That's kind of if if and then by the way and and if it's too easy to eat, I'm going to eat too much of it anyway. Yeah. Um. And then I'm going to go. Gosh, I just ate way too much jerky. Right. So uh, you know, I'll I I will always use normally hind quarter muscles for that, and I'll trim every bit of silver skin, fat, gristle, whatever. I'll cut it across the grain, about an eighth of an inch thick. Um, kosher salt, brown sugar, black pepper, um, a little of that Morton Tender Quick uh, or pink salt or any of the any of the nitrite. Um, 
I like to use a lot of different flavors. I'm gonna I, if I'm gonna put sweet in it, I like it to have a little bit of a of a of a, a hot edge to it. I like hot and sweet. Um, mm-hmm. I don't like overly sweet by itself, and I'm not a real fan of really really hot stuff. But if I kind of balance the hot and the sweet, um, you basically can pack if you you cut it into strips. Take that dry rub and you rub it completely over all sides, stack it on top um, top of each other, wrap it in plastic wrap it and stick it in your refrigerator for a couple of days. It's really not a whole lot more complicated than that. Okay. Put it into your smoker, oven, whatever, 150, 160 degrees um, on a rack, uh, and it'll be done in three or four hours, five hours, depending on your smoker. You can do it in your home oven. Just make sure you put a little foil ball in there and crack the door open a little bit because you need the you're you're trying to get the moisture out. Um, right. You know you can do it wet also. You can you can take your favorite teriyaki sauce and cut it cut it up into little strips, marinate it for 24 hours, lay it out on a on a on a rack or a, a grid, and don't try and speed up the process because. Just you, it, if you think it'll go faster at 250 degrees, it won't. Um, it's a very slow process to draw the, the moisture out. Anybody can make jerky. I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible because some people really think it's a lot more complicated than it is, and it isn't. Right. Um, and it'll save you a whole bunch of money if you make your own jerky as opposed to buying it in this grocery store on the way to the deer blind. That is true. That is, it, the stuff you buy in the store is extremely expensive. The reason I like jerky is because that gamey thing we were just talking about, right? All that kind of goes away, or for whatever reason, I can give venison jerky to anybody and they'll eat it. My kids eat it, my wife eats sure. it, and she's not a big sure. venison fan. But um, anybody that any show we've ever gone to, if we're having a guest, they'll start. And this, I have to be careful about this because they'll actually start eating it while they're talking on the show. <laughs> but it, it it just goes a long way. And sure. it, it doesn't matter how how much hemlock they ate, how much you know the acorns they got into. It doesn't matter. It's always the same result because that venison goes a lot further. And I don't have a bunch of venison sitting in my freezer all year long, waiting for the time when I feel like eating venison. Everybody enjoys it. Well, and you you before you make jerky, you're trimming away anything that's not muscle. You know, you don't normally see a lot of gristly venison jerky or with any silver skin on it. At least at least I don't. And if you're going to marinate it for 24 or 48 hours and it's thin sliced to start with, um, that's going to, you know, that it, you really, I think you could do the same thing with a tennis shoe and it would taste pretty good. <laughs> good point. Right? <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> so, so yeah, if, if you have some rangy taste in deer and it does happen, by all means, make it into jerky. Yeah, that's exactly the point I was hoping you were going to say. Sure. Excellent. Uh, let's talk just a, a little bit before we let you go, Scott, about your the business side of being a TV host and a chef that actually is on TV. How does that all work? You were, we were talking a little bit pre-show about uh, a PR person kind of helping you uh, get to a, another phase in your career uh, where you're actually making some money doing this stuff. Tell us about the whole aspect of TV in general, being on TV and, and being a, a, a chef on TV, a celebrity chef, I guess, in this case. You know, I've been doing it for a long time. I you know, I started in the late 90s on a, the HGTV thing. And um, uh, so once you're comfortable in front of the camera, it's that's the really easy part. I mean, if if you were a if I, I always think if you were a, a Food Network star, that would have to be one of the easiest, most lucrative jobs ever, um, because that part's not a whole lot of work where the work really comes in um, to be. I'm a host, producer, writer salesmen, et cetera. You know, it's uh, basically anyone can have an outdoor show, but you just have to have, you know, you need sponsors. Um, very few outdoor shows are owned by the outdoor networks. Um, they're, you know, they're mostly pretty much produced by people like me. Um, your show has to be good. People have to like your show. Um, otherwise, you're not going to have any ratings and nobody's going to care. Right. Um, but most of my time is spent sitting in front of a computer or, you know, I've done eight uh, different outdoor uh, consumer hunting, fishing type expos this year. Um, and so I, what's cool about it is I get to connect with people. 
I get to meet people, and there's nothing I like better, absolutely, than to somebody to just kind of stop in their tracks and go, wow, you're here. <laughs> Although I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and I had a couple of guys come up, and I was in the Sportsman Channel booth serving elk sausage, and uh, there's a big, in the backdrop, it was, I think, Sarah Palin and Stephen Ranella were in the, were the big names in the backdrop yep. behind me. And a guy, two guys came up and they said, wow, is Stephen Ranella here? And I said, no. And they went, oh, man, I wish he was here. <laughs> so Steve, uh, Steve's like white, white hot right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And I, you know, I absolutely applaud everything that he does. They do a great job. Steve's got people. Um, most of us don't have people, you know, having a publicist, I've got Michelle Sherman, who is a great publicist who has really within the last year or so has, has raised the bar as far as my visibility goes. I've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I started when sportsman channel started and I had a show before that on Comcast sports Southeast for a few years. So, um, and I do a lot of personal appearances. So you got to do all of that. You have to be a salesman, a businessman. It's not just a way to get free places to hunt and fish all over the country. Um, and your show has to be good. It's and, and for me, it has to be different in order to keep me interested. I have to do something that I would want to watch. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful when other people feel the same way. Not, you know, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sorry for those two guys that I wasn't Steve Ranella in Grand Rapids, but <laughs> we'll all have to work through that. Hey, I'll take you any day over over Steve Ranella. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. it. So, speaking of Steve Ranella and and this, as I've noticed recently, uh, there are podcasters, big name podcasters, that are showing up on the covers of magazines these days. Peterson's Bow Hunting, Outdoor sure. Life, specifically Joe Rogan, right, carrying a uh, a slab of uh, hindquarter over his shoulder, and he's. I feel like he's kind of a spokesperson for this movement called eat what you kill, but that's, it's more or less like this field the fork thing. It's all been around. It's being repurposed over and over. What's your feeling behind the, the whole uh, field the fork thing? You know, I I'm ambivalent about it because I think, you know, it's good that people understand that food's not raised in shrink wrap packages and, and that those of us who hunt and fish aren't, nasty mean creatures we're actually i'm gonna say we're probably as a group we're a bit more generous in giving and than other groups i think you know if there's a cause you put a, a sportsman's group behind it and we're all over it and right. we're gonna rally we're gonna rally the cause um by the same token um you know those of us who have been doing this all our lives um weren't making a big deal out of, out of it we weren't uh we weren't celebrities who have decided that they were going to go out and shoot their first deer or whatever. You know, it's been a lifestyle and, and we always knew that it meant so much to us to be outdoors. And, you know, I can sit in a duck blind or a deer stand and never pull the trigger. And I'm still so much happier than I would have been sitting in my house. If it's 21 below, maybe not so much, but if the weather isn't too ridiculous and, and I got a chance of shooting something and I can watch the sun come up and there's, you know, it's, we all know that's the experience. Um, and it's not necessarily about the kill and, and the field to fork thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to say that it's a good thing because it gets people a little bit more in touch with their, where their food comes from. Um, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not a, I'm not a newbie at, at and I'm not a foodie. I've always just kind of done this. Um, I really enjoy cooking fish and game and I love, I would rather hunt and fish then cook, but I like doing all three. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I guess that's that all does. I got. It does. Yeah. No, it definitely does. It seems like yeah, it just uh, now and then it, it catches wind and, and gets hot a little bit, but there are people have been doing this pretty much their whole life. You know, it's just becoming a popular thing to do, I guess, uh, more and so and hitting the mainstream in a lot of ways and being represented in ways that all, a lot of eyes are on it. So but, well, and, and a few years ago, I was doing a, a outdoor hunting fishing show in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was up at five o'clock in the morning to promote the show for them. 
and I was cooking venison and blah, 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 blah. And the cameras show up with KGO TV from San Francisco. And uh, they said, what are you going to cook? And I said, I've got venison, quail, salmon, blah. And they said, oh, you can't do venison. And I said, "Uh, (laughs) what? Basically, what I ended up doing was talking about cooking fish for four minutes or five minutes because they said, no, our audience would never accept you cooking venison on the TV show in the morning. Oh, wow. I mean, another reason to hate California, whatever it is, throw it on the pile. But, um, you know, it wasn't that unusual for large urban areas to have that kind of attitude. And San Francisco in particular, um, I I think you could pretty much do that now. I think I think I can cook venison on KGO in San Francisco now and nobody will care. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. It seems like that's helping in, in some ways. Right. Scott, leave us with a couple things. G- give us a, a, a book that you would recommend. Um, a book about cooking? Yeah. In general, you know, God, let me look at my shelf here. I have a hundred of them, um, and I never look at any of them, to tell you the truth. That's I've actually— Good time to go look at your bookshelf. Started. <laughs> the one that, I'll tell you the one that I kind of cut my teeth on was A.J. McLean's A Taste of the Wild, as I look at my bookshelf. Okay. Um, you know, the L.L. Bean cookbook is a great reference for people getting started, but it's a little too much. Um, I think I'm going to go with McLean's A Taste of the Wild. I think it's probably still in print. And you'll notice that I didn't plug one of my cookbooks at all. You did. Um, it was very interesting <laughs> you didn't do that. Well, I don't read mine. I mean, I know what I know what's in mine. Um, but I haven't cracked a cookbook in years, I don't think, or not much. Um, and I, so I stopped getting them. But uh, that one, as I look at, probably has the most food stains on it and the most notes written in the margins mm. of any cookbook, a game cookbook that I own. That's a good sign of a good yeah. cookbook. Um, leave us with a, a one tool that you would that you love to use. Man, it's it's got to be the chef's knife. I mean, there's just no an eight inch chef's knife for me is I mine mine's a shun. Uh, a lot of good knives out there. You got to keep a sharp edge on it, no matter what it is. Um, you know, I had mentioned that tenderizer deal, either the Jacquard or the Victor tenderizer. Mm-hmm. But I mean, really, if I don't have a knife, I got nothing. Okay. And leave us with one tip. I don't care if it's hunting or cooking. Give us one hunting or, or, or uh, cooking tip. Do not overcook it. It's that simple. Don't overcook it, whether it's fish or it's game. That is. By far the biggest mistake people make, they'll take perfectly good fish and dry it out because they're worried about whatever. You know, if you go to a restaurant and you get a nice, moist piece of fish, I promise it's not cooked to a accepted, safe temperature. Um, it's been handled properly. Don't uh, – if, if, if you're a well-done meat eater, I want you to take 15 seconds out of the rest of your life and try a slice of medium-rare venison. If you're a drinking person, go ahead and have a couple of cocktails first, if that helps you steal your nerves. But I <laughs> promise you won't die. Lesser is better. You can always throw it back on the grill. But really, that's the number one tip I can offer people is just to stop overcooking their game. Awesome. Dusty, you got any last questions for Scott? No, I don't. Scott covered a lot there. Wow. Yes, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with uh, you know what all we talked about is uh, some great – information for our listeners scott and we were much appreciated for the the time you sit with us sure thing guys it was I a pleasure I'm, I'm i'm and i think i'm finally home so i'm gonna go drink some california wines oh somewhere. beautiful i am thrilled with the content we covered here scott but this has been fantastic i'm i'm just pumped that we could throw down a bunch of great content about cooking great wild game it's awesome how can we find you scott offline or online check me out on sportingchef.com and at thesportsmanchannel.com. If you don't get The Sporting Chef on Sportsman Channel in your house, you can see it on Carbon TV online. That's Carbon TV online. Watch The Sporting Chef. Beautiful. So would you say your mouth is watering now, Dusty? Is that a Uh, fair assessment? uh, Oh, yeah. I... (laughs) I almost needed a napkin. I was like drooling. <laughs> I, I love the way he just kind of broke it down. He's not trying to get too fancy. He's not like one of those those people that when you're talking to him, it never felt like he was talking down to you like some of these gourmet chefs would do. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he wants to help. He wants to help. Yeah, I think I think taking Scott's advice and utilizing it in your kitchen and on your grill and in your smoker, anywhere else that you would cook, I, mean, I, I think that will change your whole end result and from the from the starts where it really initially kicks off. But and then you know, like he said, don't overcook your meat. But if you like overcooked meat, great. You keep doing what you're doing. Maybe try it though. Try a little different technique on that venison. You know, even on your duck or your fish or whatever, whatever wild game you decide to cook. I mean, it don't get no more organic than that, right? It doesn't. I mean, free range organic meats and bringing it down to the just the, you know the everyday hunter. All these things that he shared are things you can do at home. Yeah, you know, and, and organic meat is pretty much, in my eyes, priceless. Exactly. What? Uh, you got a Chubby Tines tip of the week? Yeah, I do. Actually, I do, you know. Uh, not, now's the time to, to get out in the woods and and see what kind of trees you got. Hmm. Why is that? Yeah, you know, it's spring. The temperatures are, are getting where you can comfortably go for a little walk. Yep. The bugs are not too bad right now. The uh, the weeds are not up in your bottoms or out in the woods. You know, it's just comfortable to walk in the woods now. I like to go check out the bark of the tree. The bark, if you can, okay. Yeah, because if you can recognize a tree by the bark, then you can say that you're somebody that's going in your habitat and being able to recognize where your deer could be. Hmm. A lot of people say it's based off the leaves, but I just feel like you need to go a little farther. Learn the bark of your trees. Anybody can walk in and say, oh, that's an oak leaf or that's a walnut leaf. But can you walk in the woods with me and point out all them trees by their bark? Right now is a great time to get in and educate yourself about your trees. There's no leaves there to distinguish of what kind of tree it is. But if you can get some information on your bark and visually be able to recognize your bark on your trees, then you've accomplished that you're somebody that can go in and talk about your habitat. Hmm. That's a good tip. Good test, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think uh, I think that's time to wrap up the show, man. How can we find you online? You can check me out at facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. I'm also at the outdoor podcast channel dot com now. And you can also send me an email at dusty at big buck registry dot com. Jay, yes, sir. how can people reach out to you at the big buck registry? If you are an iTunes listener, we would love, 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 love to have you write a review for our show. One of the things we don't get a lot of are reviews, but if you are listening to this show on your iDevice, please push that button that says leave a review. It gives us feedback, and leave us a five-star if you would, if you're, if you're a frequent listener. That would be fantastic. Uh, you can always find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. If you have a photo you'd like to submit to our 150,000 plus uh, contingent, the Big Buck Nation, you can send it to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. And if you would like to check us out on Twitter, it's twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. And on YouTube, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash YouTube. And as of a couple weeks ago, we launched a purely new channel for the Big Buck Registry that's nothing but video. We're going to do a little all audio and some video on this channel, but you can check out Big Buck Registry Film, and that's over on the other channel in the iTunes store. I think that is it. It's Big Buck, Big Buck, everywhere Big Buck. Everywhere Big Buck. Thanks for tuning in. Cannot thank you enough. Check us out. iTunes podcast channel. Leave us a pledge if you have some extra bucks. BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash pledge. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.